Welcome to this lecture on the use of application forms or blanks, biodata, training and experience evaluations, and reference checks. My, my, that's a lot of different type of tests to lump together, but we'll see how they are all at least somewhat related. Let's get started. The nature and role of application forms is that they serve as a pre-employment screen in the form of a series of questions designed to provide information on the general suitability of applicants for jobs to which they are applying. The application form has at least two key purposes. To decide if the applicant meets the minimum requirements of a position and to assess and compare the relative strengths and weaknesses of competing applicants. This information has given rise to the concept of a weighted application blank, or WAB. A WAB is an empirical scoring key that is used to score applicants on their answers on the application form. The responses are weighted so that they predict some aspect or measure of job success. So numerical scores are obtained for each applicant by summing the appropriate weights. This is accomplished using multiple regression, where each application item or answer is entered into a regression equation that has as the dependent variable some measure of job success or job performance. Of course, this would first have to be computed on a sample of existing employees who all have a range of different performance appraisal scores. Say, for example, that Smith scores a 9 out of 10 on the annual performance review. Jones scores an 8 out of 10 and poor, lowly Miller scores a 2 out of 10. We would then go back and dig up each person's application and numerically score their data. So, for example, we could score education as 1 for GED, 2 for high school diploma, 3 for associate's degree, etc. We would score years of work experience simply as the number of years, and on and on. Then we would run a regression, and it would spit out a magic formula that we would then use to predict success of future applicants. An employer would use the resulting scores to make a hiring decision. We might decide that we need to compute a predicted success level of 7 out of 10 or some such. That would tell us if the score of an applicant meets that threshold or not. Let's move on. As you might suspect, there are numerous legal implications regarding application forms. The EEOC pre-employment guidelines state that applications should not include questions that disproportionately screen out minority group members or members of one sex, that do not predict performance on the job, and that cannot be justified as a business necessity. It may seem like I'm saying the same thing again and again in these video lectures, but I cannot stress enough what a horrid job some companies do. Cover your butts and do it right. Applications should also avoid disparate or adverse impact questions, which are questions that protected classes may answer differently. For example, you should probably not ask, what part of town did you grow up in? I know, that's a stupid example, but probably none of us have ever seen such an example, but some companies do make up their own applications. If you're doing so, don't ask stupid questions. Of course, applications should also avoid disparate treatment questions, which are different questions that are asked to different groups. So don't ask something stupid like, if you are black, what is blah, blah, blah? And however, if you are white, what is this, that, and the other? Everyone should get the exact same benign job-related questions that are designed to predict job success. Let's move on. The next few green slides will cover biographical data, also known as biodata. So biodata are a broad spectrum of an individual's background, experiences, interests, attitudes, and values. This information is not the same as information gathered on an application blank. We never ask people about their attitudes or values on an application. However, biodata provide much rich, useful information on which we can make headway on an employment decision. And there are two ways to think about biodata items. The first is a response type. 
which is the kind of response options in the form of a scale that are offered to a respondent by an item. We'll see an example in a minute or so, so don't get too antsy, hang in there. The other category or way of thinking of a bio data item is by behavior type, which is the specific behavioral content or dimension of an item. This is easier to understand by looking at some examples too. So let's move on. On this slide, we see a method of categorizing bio data items by response type. We have the typical yes, no response in question one. On uh, question two, we have a sort of a continuum response style where respondents indicate where they fall on the response uh, range. In item three, we see a non-continuum item that is sort of like the multiple choice format of a college exam. You pick the one single answer that best fits the question. Of course, on this item, as opposed to a college multiple choice test, there is no correct or incorrect answer. This response format is taken a bit further in item four in which you are allowed to check all that apply to the question. So how many of you would check all five of these truthfully? Shot a rifle? Driven a car? Worked a full-time job? Traveled alone more than 500 miles from home? Repaired an electrical appliance? How many of you would check some of these? I can. In fact, I did them all before breakfast this morning. Just kidding. On item five, we expand on the response format of item four by providing essentially a none of the above option by including the father was not at home option. Item six is a non-continuum and that you could check one or sometimes but rarely even two answers, but you also have the so-called escape option. Item seven is essentially five little versions of item two, but because of the common item stem that reads here as in the last five years, you can save a lot of space by grouping the activities into one item of sorts. Now, I recommend, however, that you use a response of one to indicate not at all instead of there using a four. A two should indicate very little, etc. And you would do this so you don't have to reverse score the responses. That is, higher numbers should represent more of something, not less of it as in this question. Let's move on. Now I turn to evaluating biodata items by behavioral content. That is by the sort of information about one's behavior that the item taps into. So item one can be worded as a verifiable question or an unverifiable question. But note that the questions tap into something different. A verifiable question is simply the did you or did you not engage in a specific behavior and the unverifiable question taps into personal enjoyment. You can't verify whether or not someone enjoyed something. So let's look at item two. Looking back at an applicant's history is one thing, but asking them to engage in conjecture and provide futuristic intentions is another thing altogether. Okay, I won't belabor the point too much here, but let's look at item eight. I suspect that item eight might have some adverse impact. Some ethnic minorities tend to come from broken homes more often than do other persons. Depending upon the job for which we were seeking applicants, I favor the internal event type of question more than this specific external event question. But not all external event questions are so poorly written. Perhaps we could ask, when you were a teenager, did you have a lot of friends? But what would that tap into? What would you ask? Let's move on. Now, biodata is not without its problems. Some items are typically falsifiable. People will inflate their college grades as if college GPAs weren't inflated enough already. People will lie about the types of jobs they've held, past salaries received, past employers, educational degrees earned, don't get me started on that one, gaps in employment histories, etc. These last two are particularly interesting, at least to me. All one needs to do to verify a college degree is call the college registrar on the phone with the person's name, degree, and year that they earned it, and in two minutes, that fact is checked. 
if you have an undergraduate degree in business make sure that you know it's a bba or a bs or a ba gaps in employment history are particularly worrisome but not all gaps are problematic if you took a few years off of work to raise your child the first few years of the child's life that's admirable if you took a few years off to serve time in prison eh, that might be a bit of a problem of course there are items that are less likely to be distorted as well historical objective and verifiable items can all be checked so employers should seek to enhance application form accuracy by doing the following one inform applicants verbally and in writing that the information they furnish will affect their employability Two, inform applicants that the data they provide will be thoroughly checked three require applicants to sign a statement certifying the accuracy of the information they provided on the form four include warnings of penalties like not being hired or termination upon discovery for deliberate falsification and five include a statement that the application does not create a binding obligation of employment for any specific period of time you simply cannot be too careful when making employment decisions and the veracity of data is critical to making the correct decision let's move on On these orange slides, I'll cover training and experience or T and E evaluations. A T and E evaluation is a method of scoring the self-reported information from an applicant regarding their credentials, previous training received, licenses, work history, prior education, and KSAOs that will likely be beneficial in the performance of the job. A scoring key must be used to provide numerical measurement and the keys will differ from job to job within the same company. For example, the job of plumber requires a state issued license in some states. So licensure would be an important job related source of information to gather. But for that same company, being a carpenter probably does not require a license in most states. So gathering that information would be useless. Every applicant would respond with, no, I don't have a license to be a carpenter. Recall that score variance is an important part of score reliability, and score reliability is a necessary but not sufficient condition for validity. And it is validity that we seek in all of our selection tests. We want the test to be a valid predictor of job performance. So, okay, now, back to the T and E evaluation. It's essentially a checklist of skills that applicants complete. There are multiple ways to score the checklist, and we'll explore them later in this lecture. And then basically, a T and E evaluation focuses on the application's experience, education, and training. This is not the same as bio data. With bio data, we seek information on interest and upbringing. The T and E evaluation, evaluation is more focused on specific non-tangentially required or related concrete skills. Let's move on. So now the question is, how do we use the information we gather from a T and E evaluation? Sometimes we might use it as the sole basis for deciding if an individual is or is not minimally qualified. Think for a minute about the skilled trades like welding or being a jet engine mechanic. We don't usually hire people who can't yet weld or who think they might want to work on jet engines. We hire experienced sometimes licensed or credentialed persons to fill jobs like that. In this case, we can determine if the applicant is minim minimally qualified if they earn enough points or a high enough score on their T and E evaluation. Additionally, we can use T and E evaluations as a means for rank ordering individuals from high to low based on the T and E score. This method differs from the previous ones in that we can identify the very best applicants and then move down the list, down the line, to the others. Sometimes we use a T&D evaluation as a basis for pre-screening applicants prior to administering more expensive, time-consuming predictors like, for example, an interview, which is both time-consuming and expensive. Most often, we use a T&D evaluation in combination with other predictors used for making the employment decision. One source of information about an applicant is rarely enough. 
Let's move on. Now we turn to some common methods of scoring or rating a T&D evaluation. The holistic judgment method is sometimes used but is very ill-advised. It involves a subjective, informal, unstructured review of the T&D evaluation. A rater or decision maker simply looks over the T&D evaluation and then makes a determination on whether or not the applicant is suitable for the job. There's no scoring of the T&D evaluation. It's just subjectively reviewed. Now, because such cursory reviews of a document are completely unstandardized, the reliability and validity of it are unknown. Don't use the holistic judgment method. If you're going to the trouble to administer such an instrument, then score it in a standardized manner. Then you can objectively compare one applicant's score to another's. Remember, measurement is the systematic approach to applying numbers to things such that one can compare the thing by comparing the number. Let's move on. With the point method of a T and E evaluation, the evaluator uses a predetermined scoring system to assign numbers or scores or weights to the applicant's responses. This is a much, much, much better manner of using information from a T and E evaluation than the holistic judgment method. How you set the predetermined scores is important, and it varies from firm to firm and sometimes within firms from job to job. Typically, though, you assign points based upon how recent the training was, the amount of experience they have, the amount of education they have. Think about this for a little while. Suppose you have two applicants, and one of them has job experience or has received training, but it was, say, 20 years ago. And the other applicant has the exact same experience and training, but it was completed just yesterday. Clearly, the second applicant has more recent experience, and the recentness of the experience should probably earn them a higher score. Now let's turn to the amount of job experience. For that variable, one would simply add the amount of time to create a score. You could do it in years or months or days. Anyway, make sure that you use the exact same metric for each applicant. Next, return to the amount of education received. That can be scored by giving a GED a score of 1, high school diploma a 2, associate's degree a 3, etc., etc. Then, the analyst scores the T&D evaluation by summing the points. Now, this method tends to have high inter-rater reliability and is fairly valid in the prediction of job performance. However, how the scores are determined a priori plays a huge role in how valid the T&D evaluation actually is. Think for a minute about summing number of years of experience with a 1 for GED, 2 for high school, etc. The years of experience variable far outweighs the education variable. And if experience really, really matters, then that's okay. But if education is more important, you may want to assign numeric categories for experience. You could assign years of experience from 1 to 5 gets a 1, years of experience 6 to 10 gets a 2, etc. This then reduces the weight of the experience variable. Alternatively, and preferably, you could convert each applicant's score on each category into a z-score, and then average the z-scores for each candidate. Let's move on. The grouping method simply divides the numerous applicants into groups or categories of applicants. These groups are based upon some rank ordering of the scores, so you have to score the T&D evaluation just like in the point method. But this time, you put their T&D evaluation into four more stacks. There's a highly qualified stack of applicants, a middle group that aren't quite as good as the highly qualified applicants, a low group of applicants who have limited experience or training, and of course, an unqualified group whose scores predict that they simply cannot perform the job. This is a fairly simple technique that builds upon the point method and is very intuitively understandable. Now, we professors joke that we sometimes place student essays into the A stack, the B stack, and the oh my god, what was the student thinking stack. However, we can't place them into stacks until we assign some scores to them. 
That's what the grouping method of a T and E evaluation does. Let's move on. The behavioral consistency method of scoring a T and E evaluation is the gold standard and yields the most valid data. In this technique, it is sometimes referred to as the accomplishment record approach. So behavioral consistency method and accomplishment record approach are the same thing. Now with this technique, the applicant writes a narrative description in response to questions about key competencies that subject matter experts have identified and developed a predetermined scoring rubric for. The rubric will indicate what comprises an exceptional answer that indicates high quality training and experience, what determines a good answer, an acceptable answer, a poor answer, and an unacceptable answer. Essentially, these qualitative responses are quantified. This too is similar to how good professors score essay exams. They know what makes a great answer, what makes a good answer, etc. They assign numbers to those answers. With the behavioral consistency method of a T and E evaluation, numbers are assigned to written qualitative answers. If the rubric is well developed, any subject matter expert should come to just about the same score for any applicant's T and E evaluation almost every time. That is, the subject matter experts or SMEs should all know what is an exceptional answer, what is a good answer, etc. Moreover, they should all be able to differentiate between answers provided by differently qualified applicants. Now, this whole method is based upon the oft-stated and well-known axiom that the best predictor of future performance is past performance. It's true almost every time. Let's move on to some examples of the behavioral consistency method on the next two slides. Here we see one component of a behavioral consistency T and E evaluation for the so-called job, the so-called job of being a graduate student. Now, many graduate programs are geared toward training researchers. Think about maybe developmental psychology or cultural anthropology, etc. They are research-oriented, non-practitioner sorts of jobs. Recall that the best predictor of future performance is past performance. So the role of being a graduate student in a research-oriented program, one would hope that applicants would have some research experience. Duh! So look at the instruction section that says, write a narrative description of your activities and accomplishments. This applicant to graduate school wrote a story about their senior year thesis project in psychology. Below the narrative, they indicate who can be contacted to verify the story. Ah, uh, that's the catch. You can't simply make up stuff on the behavioral consistency T and E evaluation because if it is a true past behavior about which the applicant is not lying, then it should be able to be verified. In this case, just contact Dr. MC Prof Daddy. Let's move on. Here, the rater is given instructions on how to score the applicant's narrative. Recall that for high inter-rater reliability, every rater should come up with a similar score for each narrative. Similar. Not exact, similar. Here we see that if they simply worked as a member of a student team, designed, studied, collected, and analyzed the data and wrote a report, then they got a score of one. Did this applicant do this and did they do something more? Well, we think so from their narrative. Look at score level six. Wrote a research thesis as a graduation requirement that involved the collection of data, analysis of data, and test of research hypotheses or research questions. To earn that score, the applicant's research should have been part of the thesis and a graduation requirement. We think this applicant should get a score of six. Do you? In fact, if the hypotheses were supported, and sadly they are not listed, and not reported in the narrative, we think this applicant should try and get the study published. Then they would earn a score of seven, the highest score available. Let's move on. The next few slides in pink will cover reference checking. So why do we ask for references? We want to make sure that the information given by applicants is true. It's pretty simple. If the research check brings up some job-related and unsavory information, the applicant might be disqualified. 
Sometimes applicants actually lie on their job applications. Yes, we know it's hard to believe, but it's true. If they lie about being employed by a certain company or their role and title at the company, that can usually be uncovered with a simple phone call or an email. That saves companies tons of money that they would have spent on bringing them in for further testing or an interview, both of which can be very expensive. These reference checks also help identify background information that the applicant might not have told the company about. However, companies are increasingly worried about being sued for issues related to the provision of unsavory information, so they are quite often reluctant to give such information out. We'll explore that later in this lecture. Let's move on. The information gathered from a reference check is usually used to verify that which was given by the applicant. For example, the dates and the jobs held in an applicant's employment history as well as their academic credentials are common questions asked in a reference check. Often, an employer will ask to give information about a person's character and personality, but increasingly such information is not being offered for legal reasons explored in a subsequent slide. Typically, one tries to get estimates of an applicant's job performance. This might range from an actual score of, say, 8 out of 10, to a simple verbal score of exceptional, good, poor, inadequate, etc. However, some firms are also reluctant to give even that information, so they tended to default to simply telling the reference checker whether or not the applicant is eligible for rehire. Eligible is the key word here. If they are ineligible, then something might be wrong and should send up a red flag. Now, be careful of violating the Americans with Disabilities Act when reference checking. You cannot ask a reference any question about an applicant that you cannot ask the applicant. This includes questions of references like, what sort of disability does this person have? Remember that some disabilities are hidden. This is particularly true of mental and psychological disorders. You can't ask an applicant about their disability until after a formal job offer is made, and then the question should actually be, what sort of accommodation, if any, will you need to fulfill the requirements of this job? Let's move on. On this slide, we see the sorts of information typically and sometimes non-typically asked of references. At the top, we see that only 2% of the time does a company not ask about an applicant's dates of employment. 68% of companies always ask that, only 2% rarely or never ask it. Further down the list, we see that over half of the time, a company inquires either always or sometimes about an applicant's personality. At the bottom of the list, we see that violent or bizarre behavior is never or rarely asked about. Perhaps this is because such behavior is so infrequent that the answer is almost always, no, he never smacked anybody around here. So 999 out of 1,000 times, you're going to get no. Asking about personality is difficult as well because the naive assessment by subjective raters can be far from the truth. I recommend that you measure personality via a validated instrument. Let's move on. As you might have guessed, reference checking can run afoul of the law. There's always the risk of defamation of character if a former employer provides written or verbal false information about a former employee that damages that individual's reputation. Defamation cases all usually hinge on either libel or slander. So I suggest that you avoid providing any opinions. Just give the facts and only the facts that your company allows you to give if you are being asked to provide information about a former employee. If it's not absolutely true and verifiable, don't say it. Even if you win a legal case, it will still cost you money to defend yourself. 
if the information is that is given is true factual and appropriate and made on a proper occasion to appropriate parties it is usually considered to be what is called qualified privilege an example of being on the proper occasion would be via telephone during work hours not at a, a cocktail party where others could overhear you and your comments could probably be construed of as unprofessional and therefore no longer qualified privilege. Let's move on. Many times we seek reference information as part of our due diligence to avoid liability for what is called negligent hiring. Negligent hiring is when the following conditions are true or occur. There's an injury to a third party that is caused by an employee who was an applicant but for whom you did not check references. The employee is shown to be unfit for the job that he or she holds. The employer knew or should have known that the employee was unfit if background check or criminal check had been conducted. An injury to a third party was a foreseeable outcome resulting from hiring the unfit employee and that an injury is a reasonable and probable outcome of what the employer did or did not do in hiring the individual. Let's move on. Here are some examples of negligent hiring and things that we hope a successful reference check will avoid. Intentional employee misconduct, such as theft committed by an employee with a history of dishonesty. If the employee is caught stealing and has a criminal record for theft, but you did not uncover it because you did not conduct a reference or background check, you might be liable for negligent hiring. Of course, with physical harm, such as physical attack or sexual assault by an employee with a violent past, if this occurs, this can sometimes be negligent hiring. If an employee engages in sexually deviant behavior like exhibitionism and they have previously engaged in sexually deviant behavior and you didn't find it out, it might be negligent hiring. Acts by an employee who does not possess the requisite skill or ability to perform the job task can be negligent hiring, like an inexperienced truck driver. If the truck driver in the truck driver example, you should check their accident record and see if they have the appropriate driver's license and call past employers about their driving history. If they have a poor record and you don't even ask about it and they get on the road and kill someone, your company may be civilly liable for huge amounts of money. Do your due diligence. Let's move on. Given all the constraints of providing references about past employment to those inquiring, it seems that some folks are just scared to say anything that might open them up to a lawsuit. So here's a Dilbert cartoon that shows what reference checking has become in the modern litigious era. The woman on the phone says, Hi, I'm calling to check the reference of your ex-employee named Ted. Catbert, the HR person, says, We have a company policy against giving references, but I'd be happy to discuss the weather with you. The woman says, okay, and Catbird says, the clouds are moving lazily across the sky, and everyone thinks they're stupid. Do you get the joke? Let's move on. So I started off telling you that we'd see how all of the various tests described in this lecture are all at least somewhat related. They are all related in that they all give some insight into a person's past life history. Not past life history as in the reincarnation kind of past life, but rather these tests tell us something about what a person has been doing with their life before they applied for a job with the company. So thanks. That's all folks.